All right, great. Thanks everyone for joining us uh, this Wednesday evening. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on our fourth installment of uh, the Texas Legislative Session uh, update uh, webinar uh, from ADL Texoma, uh, ADL Southwest, and ADL Austin. Um, I'm Jake Agron. I'm the Director of Policy for ADL's uh, Central Division, uh, which spans 16 states. But over the past five, six weeks, um, really most of my time has been on Texas. So it's been uh, great uh, to, to join you tonight and to uh, hear from some of our great panelists that we have lined up. Um, so it was an eventful uh, legislative session in Texas, um, and we're, we're still at it. Um, we've had some great uh, sessions uh, over the past few months. Uh, we've heard from elected officials. We've heard from leaders um, in various communities who advocate at the legislature. And um, tonight we're going to be hearing a bit more from some of our guests and reflecting on what happened at the legislature this year. Um, and I just want to say thank you, not just for joining us, but for those who took action this year with us on behalf of ADL um, to contact legislators. Um, some of that work was really meaningful. Um, we had uh, engagement, for example, on bills like Senate Bill 2482 that would have um, urged the state to undertake uh, a study of how Holocaust education is being implemented. Um, over 160 of our volunteers contacted the legislature. Um, Senate Bill 1515, that bill would have required uh, classrooms to display one version of the Ten Commandments. Um, over 300 volunteers contacted the legislature, and that bill, in fact, ultimately did not pass. So um, your, your work and, and your contact and your advocacy is making a difference, and so uh, we want to say thank you, and there will be more opportunities to come. Um, so tonight, um, we're going to hear from our Associate Director of Policy, Courtney Toretto, to hear a little bit more about the outcome of some of the issues that ADL advocated on this session in Texas. And uh, But first, we're going to hear from three great panelists, and Jake Kurtz, our Director of Communications, is going to moderate and introduce our guests. As a reminder, if you have questions, please drop them in the uh, on, on your Q&A section, and we will be uh, getting to them, uh, hopefully, uh, as many as we can. So, Jake, I'll turn it over to you now, and thanks once again, everyone, for joining. Great. Thanks, Jake. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jake Kurtz. Like uh, Jake said, I'm the Director of Communications for the same set of 16 states, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you as well uh, for all of your efforts. I'd also like to shout out Jake uh, and, and Courtney Eric and the rest of the team for all the work they put in to keep up with this legislative session. Uh, we're really fortunate today to have three great panelists with us. And uh, I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, we have uh, Robert Downen. He is the democracy reporter for the Texas Tribune. Um, he uh, uh, works with uh, you know democracy and threats to our democracy, including extremism, disinformation, and conspiracies sort of sounds familiar, kind of right up our alley. Uh, before joining the Tribune, he worked uh, with the Houston Chronicle, where he developed the abuse of, uh, of faith, uh, the landmark investigation into child sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, and that, that prompted uh, Department of Justice investigation. So, Robert, thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, we also have uh, Katya Erisman. She's a grassroots organizer for Common Cause Texas. Um, She's actually the voting rights program manager, pardon me, uh, with Common Cause Texas, and she has uh, years of experience with youth and issue-based organizing, policy research, coalition building, and has also worked with the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life, Campus Vote Project, Texas Civil Rights Project, Civic Center, and several political campaigns. Uh, already more accomplished than me in a day than what I could do maybe in five years. So Katya, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. And then uh, finally, uh, Rocio Fierro Perez, she's the uh, senior political coordinator for Texas Freedom Network. Uh, uh, immigrant to our country from Mexico, grew up in El Paso, uh, is responsible for policy development and electoral strategy uh, for issues related to immigration, LGBTQ uh, plus equity, uh, criminal legal reform, voting, climate uh, justice, and uh, reproductive rights at statewide and local level. Once again, someone super accomplished, and we're uh, really happy to have you here, Rocio. All right, so let me set up very quickly uh, with our 
uh, kind of norms here, we're going to try and stick within the framework of what it is that ADL does if we can. So my questions will be related to if it's not fighting anti-Semitism, it'll be combating extremism, disrupting uh, online hate and harassment, protecting civil rights, securing democracy, and um, just making sure that our, our educational spaces uh, are, are protected to challenge bias. So with that, I'd like to start just kind of open it up to either of the three of you. Just give me kind of one word maybe to describe this legislative session that has now been extended. I was going to say unfinished, but exhausting also works. Um, <laughs> I was going to say exhausting, but I think uh, tumultuous might work. Those are both very accurate words. Uh, something that I was thinking about was like really relentless, uh, relentless in the attacks on all angles, but also relentless in our advocacy. So that's what comes to mind for me. Yeah, all all, uh, all great, uh, great ways to, to explain this uh, this session. Um, so what were some of the biggest policy issues coming into the session? And then how did those play out? Did they did they continue to be the largest issues? Or were there sort of uh, new issues that came up that kind of took over the, this session? And I'll, uh, Robert, I'll start with you and then I'll go to the others. Yeah, I'll kind of, you know, defer to the other panelists for the kind of where, where they obviously have much more of their focus. But, um, you know, just going, going into the session, obviously, you know, there were among the priority bills, um, we had property taxes and school choice. I know we'll get into the latter in a bit, um, but the biggest, I think, or among the biggest uh, focuses was on anti-LGBTQ bills. I mean, we saw at least 70 uh, bills filed um, before the start of, or during the session that would have, you know, in some way chipped away at LGBTQ rights. Um, this session we saw, you know, bans on uh, puberty blockers and hormone therapy for children, uh, restrictions on what college teams that trans athletes could join, um, a kind of expansion of what sexual conduct in the terms of a of a uh, performance means uh, ostensibly a drag ban, but it had kind of its language paired back. And then, you know, there was a Texas version of the Don't Say Gay bill in Florida that um, missed a deadline. But I would say that those were obviously, you know, definitely the, the biggest focal points of this legislation and, and drew the most opposition. Um, and, you know, on the other side, a lot of support too. So. And Katya, how about you? Are there any any sort of uh, big ones coming in that you were focused on and then some that maybe came up that sort of took over that surprised you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, last year, last legislative session, um, SB1 was the big omnibus anti-voting bill that caused members to break quorum and leave the state. And, uh, you know, elections became a center point of the 87th legislative session, as well as many of their special sessions. So I think going into the session, we were... Um, kind of worried given that backdrop that it would continue. Um, we also, you know, we're looking at other states that have been um, among Texas and the center points of passing, you know, suppressive laws on the election side. Uh, Florida using election marshals and police forces at polling locations. Georgia doing, you know, a statewide takeover of election administrators. Um, and so I think we saw some of those happening prior to our session and we're worried that um, those were going to be the backdrop of what we expected to see this year. Um, Fortunately for elections, but unfortunately for Texans writ large, I think we saw other issue areas like Robert mentioned, especially attacks on LGBTQIA Texans and, um, you know, a lot of extremism uh, take center stage and elections kind of fall a little bit further back than uh, than they had been in the 87th session. Um, that said, you know, there were a number of issues and policy areas within the election space that we saw a lot of movement on and, and mobilized against, um, those being um, kind of the bucket of conspiracy theory, uh, having Texas leave Eric out of a conspiracy theory of, um, you know, anti-Semitic donors or, um, you know, it being a, um, a, a, a system that isn't necessarily um, accurate with voter lists. None of those are founded or substantiated, but Texas still decided to join a lot of other red states and uh, removing us from that election uh, voter registration system. And um, also, you know, use the entire weight of the legislature to effectively fire the Harris County elections administrator and take over their office. And so, um, you know, I think we saw that bucket of work, but also, um, 
uniquely some more movement towards bipartisan compromise on election issues. And I think that was attributed to years of organizing in, in the space, especially following SB1. Um, we actually had a handful of of bills improving curbside voting and improving the mail-in ballot online tracker. And those had bipartisan sponsors on it. And so, um, you know, we entered session with, I think, over 300 election bills filed that we are tracking. At any point, 83 of them were getting hearings. Um, and then by the end, I think there was maybe four that were, you know, truly bad bills, but um, almost half a dozen that that actually maybe improved some of our election infrastructure. And, and largely that was because we had hundreds of Texans show up and, and testify for and against some of those bills and, and really mobilize in force. So um, that was kind of what we were watching on the election space. And uh, Rocio, how about uh, how about you? Did, did, was there anything uh, that really stuck out to you ahead of the session and 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 within the session? Yeah. So I mean, ahead of the session, we all like to guess at what we think is going to be the priority, but we never really know, right? Um, but we did know that extremist lawmakers were probably going to be putting a lot of energy into dismantling public education, attacking the LGBTQA community, particularly trans youth and their loving, affirming families, right? And as a multi-issue organization, it felt like they took a look at what we do and said, let's do that, let's attack all of these issues. Um, that's certainly how it felt, um, which makes it incredibly difficult for us to prioritize because they're all so important, but the main issues that we were looking at this session were education censorship, vouchers, the LGBTQIA plus community, voting and climate. Um, which all ended up being uh, a priority throughout the entire session. Um, we had a lot of wins and some losses, but um, like I said, we can all predict what's going to be happening, but we don't really know. And a good example of that is um, what happened with immigration, some really bad immigration bills, um, which ended up being another one of our priorities, especially uh, for me growing up on the border of El Paso, which is where I am right now visiting my family. Um, and another one is vouchers. Um, vouchers is a bread and butter issue for us at TFN. And although uh, they're dead right now, uh, remember we were probably gonna have some other special sessions coming up um, because they didn't succeed in, in passing. Um, and then as already been mentioned, some of the most extreme anti-trans um, and anti-LGBTQ pieces of leg legislation that I've been passing through Texas and other states, um, but you know, we're still here and we're gonna be here through any special session that comes up. So there's still a long way to go. Yeah, well, uh, th thank you for, for that, Rocio. And, and since you brought up uh, the voucher issue, um, uh, I, the governor is talking about um, bringing that back up in special session, though uh, in his proclamation, he doesn't mention it uh, for this special session. He didn't uh, bring it up. So I guess I guess the question is, um, what is the disconnect? Why couldn't they get that passed? And uh, what do you think is going to be the future of it here in this special session of of uh, the the idea of school vouchers here in Texas? Well, I think it comes down to basic numbers, right? It wasn't mathing, and he didn't like that, so he didn't have the votes. Um, so he's going to take all of the summer, which is when teachers have the most time, to try to get gather all of those votes. And we're anticipating that coming up in September when teachers don't have the time and when teachers are back in school. So it, we anticipate it's gonna be back. Like you said, he mentioned that was one of his priority issues. And he's really upset because there are a lot of Republicans, especially in rural communities that are not in favor of vouchers, regardless of how you frame it and whatever you wanna call it. Um, so he still doesn't have the votes. And we don't think that they're gonna have the votes, but like I said, we, we don't know until we know. So we're getting ready for that fight that's coming up in September, which is when we're anticipating it coming, but we don't know, we'll see, we'll see how that goes, but that's, that's what we're thinking right now. Any other thoughts, Robert or Katya on uh, vouchers and the disconnect that, that exists? Um, or even or even what you think the, the future of, uh, of vouchers might be here in Texas? I was just gonna say, you know, it is it is interesting that despite all the oxygen that's been, you know, how, how, despite how much oxygen this has taken up during the session, um, it really doesn't feel like much, the, the needle has moved that much. And I, again, I, I agree completely that it, it does kind of seem, you know, 
I don't want to say insurmountable because obviously you never want to count anything out. But you know, at the end of the day, these are these these local schools are job creators. They are you know staples of rural communities in particular, and um, there's already a lot of I think anguish to put it lightly uh, in those in those areas of the state. You know, you look at a district that has you know 60, 70, 80 million dollar football stadiums, and you're uh, you know there's a Texas Monthly article that came out yesterday talking about you know this one school that had I think like 93 year old urinals, and so I think that it's it's not exactly palatable to a lot of these rural districts to then all of a sudden be trying to flip the entire school finance system on its head while not even addressing the core issues that they've been warning about for deck for i mean you know a long time now so yeah and if i could just uh, you know i i think add one more point to it is that the current discussion of property taxes i think goes hand in hand with the discussion of vouchers that we expect to see in september our school finance system is incredibly antiquated given the way that the state funds social services like our public schools but also like you know the absence of, of health care across the state and so you know one thing that we are seeing right now in in the debate between the house and the senate is the discussion of the idea of wanting to eliminate property taxes having a direct correlation with the uh, eliminating of funding for public schools and public school systems. And, and that's a discussion that they're having right now that will have a direct impact on how vouchers play out in September. And so I think the word that you used for disconnect is exactly the right word to kind of uh, deploy not only between, you know, within a party's caucus, but also within issue areas that are actively being debated in these um, kind of run on and special sessions that we're seeing this summer. And, uh, and Katya, we'll, we'll start with you on this, uh, this next question. So like you mentioned, last session, um, sweeping changes to election laws. And then 2023 was sort of up in the air. We didn't know what it would look like. What did it look like, in your opinion, as far as uh, voting rights were concerned uh, this session? Yeah, you know, I think, as I mentioned, we had, I think, over 350 election bills introduced and filed at the beginning of session, um, ranging from election police to eliminating campus uh, polling locations to banning uh, countywide polling to giving election judges handguns during early voting to state takeovers. There were um, dozens of different variations of subversive, subversive attacks on our elections, um, you know, nefarious attempts to undermine not only the access people have to vote, but the the power of their vote by letting the Secretary of State or the governor call for new elections. Um, and so those were all filed in the beginning. And I think when we saw um, kind of in February and March what the landscape of the legislative session were going to look was going to look like for elections, we called it a death by a thousand cuts to our election system um, because it wasn't this one omnibus Senate Bill one that we were watching that Texans knew to look for. Um, it was hundreds of bills that Texans were expected to follow, to testify against, to track, to know, um, to communicate to their friends and family. Um, and that was hard and, and intentionally so to make it obstructive and opaque for regular Texans, let alone advocacy groups like, like us and TFN and, and reporters like Robert to follow. Um, and so I, I think that was how it was very different compared to SB1, was just the onslaught and barrage of, of attacks that we were facing. Um, but, but, you know, I think in the end, when we saw a handful of the bills kind of crystallize and become the final end game of, of the, you know, election subversion suppression strategy, um, what we saw wasn't, you know, unique barriers created for Texans, like like with the mail-in ballot changes from SB1, but we saw, you know, these attempts to allow for a partisan appointee from the governor, which is the Secretary of State's office, um, take over a local election offices and dilute the power of Texans' votes and potentially get veto power over local policies and procedures that they could do in the biggest county in the state, in the county with the most uh, diverse populations, the most BIPOC community members within Harris County. And, and I think that's intentional, and that was done to suppress um, the power of, of, you know, black and brown and, um, and diverse Texans in, in that growing county. And so I think that's kind of what we saw this year that was different than last year is, is even if the barriers don't look as explicit, it was um, arguably a more dangerous session in, in terms of the long-term effects that it could have. Uh, that's, that's, that's great insight. And then, and then for you, Rocio, how are you, how are you supposed to organize people to, uh, and get the word out in a space where it's just so spread out? How are you supposed to do that in, in this case? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the really great thing about um, working with people like Katya and our partners is that a lot of us have resources, um, different types of resources. For example, 
Um, at TFN, we have a, a youth program called Texas Rising, where we have youth chapters um, on college campuses um, across all of the state of Texas. We have 22 chapters. Um, and so we do our best to first talk about what the bills are. I think one of the things that was uh, something I want to wanted to mention is these bills are starting to, these bills this session for voting were more nuanced and more difficult to explain to some folks. And that was the challenge. Um, and a lot of people get lost when it, it isn't easy messaging, but we had folks like Gatia, like I said, that were really great and our partners working to create the messaging for people to understand what is happening and then make sure that we tell folks from across uh, the state to come and show up. We had multiple pushes of bringing folks from all across the state. Um, and like I mentioned at TFN, we do multiple issues. So um, when we couldn't show up at, for one issue in the way that we wanted to, we leaned on our partners. And um, a lot of that is communicating and being a part of a group of organizations that we know we're here for the long run. We know that um, we have to show up for each other and reach out as much as we can. And we know that people get tired uh, when you just told them to show up last week and you're like, this other bill is just as important and we need, we need you to come. So just trying to create that messaging that this is important to not lose hope and digestible so that people understand what's at stake. And then, and then for you, Robert, it's gotta be next to impossible to A, prioritize whatever it is you want to uh, report on. And then, and then secondly, sort of make it concise and clear to, to, to your readers. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I guess what you mean with respect to voting with respect to voting or, or with respect to, you know, sort of a, a, a spread out sort of, uh, you know, by, by, you know, paper cut, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, legislation that could that kind of spread out. So you can't maybe focus on one thing or another. Yeah, and I think that was a, that you know we had our kind of postmortem um, on the ledge as a, as a team last year yesterday, and kind of one of the things we were talking about too is just kind of acknowledging that it was there was so much going on from you know everywhere all at once with this session where it sometimes was really hard for us to take that to find the the space and time to step back and you know write those more enterprise stories that you know kind of contextualize two or three or four pieces of legislation. Um, like I, you know, I wrote something fa fairly, length fairly lengthy about the broader erosion of church and states, and even that was complicated because, you know, you like by the time you get around, you know, by the time you have a story finalized, something totally new has developed, and it just it it, it was very difficult to stay vigilant and stay on top of everything that was happening during this session um, in a way that allowed us to really contextualize it to readers, and and you know, I I. I, I I'm, I'm glad that other people, I guess, not glad. But I'm, it, I thought for a moment it was only me, but it, apparently that was a, a feature, not a bug. So mm -hmm. that's that's great. Well, speaking uh, of um, sort of legislation that has to do with separation of church and state, uh, we had a couple of bills like uh, Ten Commandments, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, on the docket, and so. Um, Ten Commandments did not uh, get to the governor's desk, but do you see this as something that will continue? Uh, we'll continue to see sort of uh, um, a right-leaning sort of uh, evangelical movement to pass legislation. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that, and I think that's really going to be the story of this state. I mean, it ha already has been in many ways, but will be the story of the state's political moment for a long time. I mean, I, first of all, I think Dan Patrick actually said last week that he may want the Ten Commandments bill uh, in a special session, but I am not positive on that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, we wrote about a lot, too, was this chaplain's bill. And there are all of these different things that, you know, it's not just that there's an insertion of Christian, you know, teachings into the public schools is that it also really raises the temperature at these local school districts that have already been inundated by by, you know, religious extremists and a lot of infighting over CRT over, you know, you know, broader curriculum, um, all these different things. I shouldn't say over CRT because it's not a thing that's happening there, but like, um, but, and I think that, you know, what we're seeing in the ledge is, is a variety of attempts to, you know, one, dictate what schools can and can't do on this front, but also just 
make it so much more consequential for who is, you know, winning these school district seats, who's running your local school board. And I think that it's, it's something that is not going away anytime soon. You know, one of the stories I'm kind of floating around in my head right now is looking at the way that some of these groups that, you know, used to put all their money into the, into legislative candidates are now really refocusing their, their, their money and resources towards more local hyper-local stuff. Um, and I think that that's because they also see that this is really going to be the next frontier in this, what they describe as a culture war and, you know, have, have had a lot of really, you know, important wins on that front to them. And I think that they're more energized than they have been in a while. And also, the broader normalization of Christian nationalism has allowed them to just be more upfront about what their end game is here. You know, one of the things that was, you know, pretty common during the session was lawmakers just openly saying church state separation is a myth. It's not a real thing. Um, you have people like David Barton, the wall builders founder, and, you know, a longtime Christian nationalist um, testifying in, in favor of bills. And again, this, this is stuff that, you know, always was, was, was never not in Texas politics, but um, it certainly seems to be uh, just nakedly, you know, the, 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 there's, there's no secret about what, what the end game is in, in, in many of these instances. And I think that that is, like I said, kind of gonna be the story of the next few years. And Katya, same, same to you. Do you see that to continue to be a trend? Is there, is there room for uh, folks of many backgrounds to have input here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, truthfully, Common Cause doesn't do as much work on the ground within, um, you know, this fight specifically of, of the separation of church and state and the increasing kind of extremism on that front. But um, what we have been doing is a lot of work on the kind of dark money behind a lot of the um, big organizations like ALEC that are kind of funded by these extremists that then help as Robert mentioned, you know, put people into the legislature or author the bills that then get like sent over to a member's office to that get filed. And, and, you know, we were seeing a really increase in a sharp increase in um, these kind of third party dark money groups writing the legislation that is so dangerous and harmful, especially in this kind of increasing religious extremism time, um, and then writing the talking points for the members to lay out and then mobilizing their people to go testify for it. And there, we're seeing a lot of rule changes where these bills are getting pushed with like 24 hours notice, suspending the posting rule, so that way regular Texans can't testify against them. And, and I think that's intentional. It, we're seeing kind of an increase of um, you know, legislative uh, disorganization or, or um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, bad faith happening within the, the rulemaking of, of the legislature and, and seeing these bills move. Um, and I think as a good government organization, that's where we're kind of watching these bills um, and, and seeing a lot of concerning trends um, that I think point to the next few years as, as kind of a darker fight on, on the extremist side of, of legislation. And then for you, Rocio, I know, um having a sort of a, a evangelical, a more evangelical um, uh, focused legislature probably makes your job more difficult uh, as it relates to LBG, LGBTQ plus uh, issues, um, even criminal reform, uh, climate change, uh, reproductive rights, et cetera. Uh, so is this something that, uh, that you see continuing? And, and if so, any thoughts on uh, what we can all do to, to you know, um, maybe bring in more people to the conversation. Right. Yeah. I mean, for decades now, we've seen how the religious right will stop at nothing um, to inject their personal religious agendas into our lives and take away our freedoms in the process. And we know that's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, these issues and bills um, where culture is so deeply embedded that people that normally are outside of politics are going to pay attention. Um, and unfortunately, that's what extremist politicians are interested in exploiting, right? All bills are essentially values-based, um, and so are religious freedom bills. And what makes them so popular and can be dangerous um, is the way that religion can form is a part of somebody's identity. So um, using religion as a quote unquote moral vehicle to pass hateful and ignorant uh, legislation is not new, um, not at all. And that's actually how TFN got its start more, almost 30 years ago at the State Board of Education, uh, where we were fighting things like something as absurd as making sure that they don't add Moses as a founding father. 
Um, that is true. That happened. We had to fight to make sure that Moses was not included as a founding father. And now like the 10 command, yeah, it's, it's laughable how ridiculous this is. And then we talk about the session, right? Almost 30 years later, we're talking about fighting a bill to stop them from plastering the 10, a version of the 10 commandments on every single classroom in the state of Texas. Right. Uh, we had a lot of those discussions about the, the separation of church and state and, it was really, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, like having to sit there at those hearings and listening to their explanation for why this is something that is necessary. And for us as an organization that, you know, does a lot of work around religious freedom, one of our other programs is called Just Texas, where we um, mobilize, educate, train uh, people um, of faith, faith leaders, uh, congregations, where they are able to speak to their congregations about uh, the LGBTQ community in an inclusive way, about reproductive rights. And what we often do is bring them in and have them testify because we have a lot of people on the other side that are using religion as a form to discriminate and to, um, you know, inflict their their values and what they believe, but we have people of faith that come and say, you know, my faith does not discriminate and I'm a person of faith that is a leader in my congregation. So that's really important for us and we are going to continue to be mobilizing that. Um, our program continues to grow every single year um, and we know that this is going to be something that's going to continue to come back. So um, yeah, I think that's something, uh, I was going to say something else, I can't remember. I think the main thing is just understanding that, you know, religious freedom, as was mentioned earlier, is protected in our constitution, um, and it's fundamental to our constitution and um, how we were founded, but laws that are weaponizing faith and taking away our particular community's rights um, are not about religious freedom. It never is. It's about control, and we know that our state is a tapestry of diverse faith communities and true religious freedom is that there is no singular religion whose views are above everyone else. Um, and, the, and when we start focusing on that and bills that are focused on that, that's really what um, endangers all of us. And we're ready to continue being the watchdogs of the religious right as we have been for almost 30 years. I was going to say, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, you know, you said a, a version of the Ten Commandments. And I think that's actually right. kind of key because like, it, it it is interesting to me that, you know, even in the debates that we're having about like religious plural, plurality in Texas, like there's not even a conversation about whose version of the Ten Commandments would even be on there because it's so outside of the scope of the people pushing that. And I think one of the things that's, you know, kind of concerned me about, you know, I guess that has been noteworthy to me about some of these pushes is I think that there are a lot of people who look at it and are like, oh, that's so extreme that there's no way it'll be upheld by, you know, it'll get struck down by the courts. It'll get, you know, this, this, this will just, we'll have egg on our face and we'll move on. And I think that what people often miss is that some of these groups that are pushing this legislation are pushing for those legal challenges. They understand that they have support in higher courts and that if they, you know, in the same way, the Kennedy decision and this, these, this, these myriad other decisions that have really opened the floodgates for this erosion of church state separation, they're kind of looking for that fight. And, you know, it, I guess it, it has been surprising to me and a little bit concerning to hear people kind of relying on the courts to uh, uphold this. I mean, this is the same court that said that a 40 foot crucifix on Virginia public land was not an endorsement of Christianity. So um, it, it is interesting to me, I guess, that people are relying on them to be the arbiter of, of what religious freedom and church state separation looks like at this point. So, Yeah, and that's true. No matter what version of the Ten Commandments you put up in classrooms, it is going to go against the majority of Texans and their beliefs. So and, and, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I haven't seen polling directly on the Ten Commandments, but a lot of these bills are actually, I brought up the whole, you know, reliance on the courts things. But I think, you know, generally, a lot of these bills are actually deeply unpopular. It's just that people are kind of under the assumption that they don't have to do anything about it because it's on its face seems ridiculous. But, uh, you know, history shows us over and over and over again that that's that relying on the courts to uphold or maintain or strike down laws that people find extreme has traditionally not really been the case. So, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm supposed to go to audience questions now if we have any. 
Uh, Mr. Agron, do we have any uh, uh, audience questions at the moment? We do have some, and we'll try to get to um, a good chunk of them. We may not get to all. So thank you, everyone, for submitting questions. We, we got a lot. Um, the first one uh, that came in, um, want to know if um, we could address the elimination of DEI offices um, and functions on public university campuses. I believe this was SB 17. Um, any thoughts from our panelists on um, what you saw as that bill went through the process, as well as what some of the impact may be. I know this was a trend, not just in Texas, other states looking to uh, get rid of DEI offices um, and the functions they play. So I'll, I'll throw it to anyone on the, the panel who wants to um, address, but uh, your thoughts on that bill, which was signed by the governor. And, and if no one wants to go first, we can all do a, a agreement. We didn't like that bill, or or Robert, you don't have to agree to that, but you can uh, you, you can agree. Uh, I can th throw it to our panelists, uh, Rocio. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we can definitely all be in agreement that we did not like this bill, right? Um, but for when we're talking about DEI, I think a lot of people are nervous about what exactly it means and. I think a lot of us are still digesting what the ramifications are of some of these bills. Um, you have in certain cases where entire departments are going to be wiped out because it's the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, right? But when you look at the core of what the bill is targeting, it's um, targeting the otherness of people, all of the minority groups, all of the most marginalized people in our communities. This bill is attacking them and, and making sure that it's taking away any resources um, in a way that, like, I never thought a bill like this would happen because I'm like, this is just so clearly racist. This is so discriminatory. How can a bill like this pass? And, you know, it's, it's one of those bills that really took me aback this session. Um, now I'm not surprised by anything that goes through the Texas ledge because it's gonna do what it does. Um, but we are doing everything that we can to try to work around that and trying to find ways. I know a lot of teachers personally that don't know how to, how to go about teaching in the classroom in a way that uh, makes it possible for them to teach. Um, and a lot of teachers are leaving because one, I mean, one of the big issues is also not being able to get paid, right? Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but like, for example, vouchers, uh, pay raises for teachers was a really big deal and was going around um, all over the news. Um, and it was a really big focus, but they held that um, and didn't give teachers pay raises because of vouchers. So I think going back to DEI, I think it's one of the worst bills um, that passed this session and that we are not gonna know the ramifications of it uh, until later, uh, the, the real extent of it all. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it, honestly. I'm not sure if Katia, you have anything else you wanna add or Robert? Yeah, I, I'll jump in on kind of a procedural point, I think. Um, you know, I think there's, everybody learned a poo this year. Like it, it was like a big thing that we we're doing watching the Texas Sledge. If it was your first session, you were like, oh, points of order. It was a big thing this year. And I think largely it was because in these culture war type bills like SB 17 and SB 18, the writing was incredibly sloppy because it was done with the intention of adding this red meat kind of uh, issue to the legislative agenda and, and to the, the lawmaking process um, in a way that included words like polarizing or um, like some say that the EI offices are overstaffed, but who can qualify some say when a background and purpose doesn't actually substantiate any of these claims that are being made and these kind of, um, you know, red meat uh, bills like, like the DEI bans. And so I think one thing that we saw increasingly this session than we had it before were these points of order being called on these kind of red meat um, bills because they were written in such a way that 
um, we're just kind of reiterating these talking points from um, you know, conservative issue groups as opposed to actually wanting to substantively improve staffing issues or curriculum development in college or higher education campuses or or in our public schools. And so, um, you know, I, early in session or I guess early in the debates on, on these bills, it was, I think, in April and, and early May, um, we saw Senate Bill 18 get sent back to committee and forced to be redrafted in parts because of a point of order being called on it um, that, that got to the point of the issue of, of these bills is being unsubstantiated and the concerns um, that were being brought by the by the lawmakers that were moving them and and um, you know a lot of the rhetoric that we saw against DEI and, and, and justification of these bills were um, were unfounded and and the lawmakers weren't able to answer questions from members asking you know where will students uh, of color go to get help in any of the you know diverse needs of of curriculum or assistance or housing or you know any of the myriad of things that students need when getting help in in higher education especially as first gen students you know increasingly navigate our higher education campuses at a in faster rate now than they ever have in texas and so um yeah i, I think we saw a lot of um really embarrassing debate truthfully about some of these bills and, and being unsubstantiated and, and being uh you know unable to answer questions and then we also saw um, you know, a lot of those holes being poked in in kind of the the really conspiratorial lawmaking process. And so uh, I think Rosie is exactly right on like the substance and the concerns of, of some of the debate, but I just kind of wanted to add that from a procedural side. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that I've kind of been keeping tabs on over the last few weeks, if maybe months or so, is we're starting to see uh, Chris Rufo, the Manhattan Institute guy who really was behind the CRT panic and is DeSantis's basically kind of hatchet man in Florida right now. Um, you know, he's really setting his sights on Texas from DEI and to a, an increasing degree, you know, trans clinics um, or gender affirming care clinics. And, you know, it's just, I, I think it's really, we're really in the age of one person with a loud megaphone and a lot of angry followers really being able to dictate from not even within a state, dictate, you know, how lawmakers are acting. We saw it with Tucker Carlson and Abbott, I mean, uh, you know, we saw it with Matt Walsh and the campaigns that he spearheaded and we're seeing it increasingly with Chris Rufo in Texas University. So it's just that. Uh, again really a sign of the polarization that we are in because you know all it takes is someone to say hey i i you know use use some scary sounding verb verbiage around like i i obtained these documents through freedom of information requests they don't want you to know about it and if you actually look at it it's just like oh they defined what like bisexuality is and you have a problem with that somehow but when they frame it and push it out to their extremely angry and extremely extreme uh, followers it's it's having real tangible uh, um, you know consequences on statewide policy even though they don't even live here so if i could jump in actually really quickly i think robert brought up a good point um you know that was also happening early in the budget process as well um the budget like prohibited state money from going towards universities that have dei which i think was like a landscape before we even got to senate bill 17 and 18 as they were moving through the legislature but what it didn't prohibit was you know university of texas putting their money towards the civitas institute which is largely staffed by and you know ran by uh you know out-of-state actors that want to um kind of propagate their own uh you know more conservative ideology and, and that's like a, a conservative think tank that's being founded out of UT and, and that's where our state funding was allowed to go but um, I think some of the bigger public universities UT and A&M were at some point almost being threatened as, as pulling their funding um, from the kind of state uh, bucket that would go to to universities um, if they didn't allow for a version of DEI bans to pass. And so there is a lot of kind of like strings being pulled by these out of state actors that had, you know, unique political or financial interests in these bills um, that were really putting, you know, the entire funding of our universities at risk, not just, um, you know, the curriculum and, and the access to, you know, necessary diversity, uh, equity and inclusion policies. It's, it's funny that many of the same people pushing against XYZ policy on, because of a shadowy, you know, anti-Semitic dog whistle, because of these out-of-state forces that are running everything are actually, you know, doing the exact same thing that they're accusing the other side of, so. Yeah, we, we had a question come in um, along those lines of noticing that Alliance Defending Freedom was very involved in a lot of bills this uh 
session. Uh, I think the question asked if we know information about them. Um, I happen to know they're based in Scottsdale, Arizona, because I'm from Arizona. Um, but it, does anyone want to speak to just in general, kind of the, I know you touched on this, in, um, but some of the organizations, and we don't have to focus on just one kind of pushing um, model legislation in Texas and um, anything that, you know, you think we might expect to see uh, that maybe we saw in other states that will come to Texas soon. We kind of answered that a little bit, but Katya, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think ADF is an, a great example of it. I think uh, Josh Hawley's wife is even on the board of ADF, um, which is maybe an example of like these federal kind of conspiracy theorists wanting to, you know, move um, policy into Texas or take control over Arizona, Texas policy, whatever that might look like. Um, True the Vote is also an example of one of the election integrity groups that actually has multiple, um, you know, campaign finance violations and lawsuits against them for, um, you know, some of the, the, for lack of a better word, crazy um, ties to um, political financing and, and, um, and they have a huge presence in Texas and have been largely active in supporting, uh, you know, election deniers into office and, and authoring legislation that, um, that we see move through the Capitol and, and those things like the Harris County elections administrator uh, removal or, or the state takeover bills. And so I think those kind of come to mind, um, you know, largely what we see. Uh, I think the Southern Poverty Law Center has a really good listing of, of uh, you know, hate groups that then are directly tied to um, a lot of the same legislation that will pop up in Arizona and will pop up in Georgia and will pop up in Florida. And because of the nature of Texas's biannual session, um, we have 15 months for lawmakers like Greg Abbott or Dan Patrick to get inspiration from hate groups in other states and then start authoring that legislation here. Um, and I think, you know, when we look at national databases like SPLCs or like what ADF is doing in Arizona and elsewhere, um, you know, I think we see that movement in, in Texas as well because of the timeline uh, that our legislature happens on. Well, great. Um, that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, again, thank you so much for submitting them. I think maybe we have inspiration for doing another one of these uh, live interest from, from our audience. We didn't um, even get to talk about Ken Paxton. I mean, that was, that's, oh, my gosh. We, we do, we have, do we have another No, no <laughs> don't want to, don't want to dive in there. No. Well, well, great. Before we sign off from our panelists, um, just a huge thank you for, for your work, whether it's in journalism or advocacy. Uh, we appreciate it. Want to give you an opportunity, just if you want to plug your, your websites, your organizations, um, social handles or anything you'd like to plug. So if our ADL volunteer uh, leaders want to follow your, your work where they can go. I, I'll, I'll be the first to shamelessly promote myself. Um, yeah, you can just follow me on Twitter at Robert Downen underscore, but also would uh, just use this opportunity to plug, obviously, the Texas Tribune, but Trib Fest coming up in September. I'm uh, hosting two panels, one on Christian nationalism with uh, hopefully the president of the Southern Baptist Convention and some other folks, and then another one on conspiracies and threats to democracy. So if, if you... Uh, you know, I think uh, all topics that are, are pretty germane to this conversation. So thank you again for having me. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I accidentally hit enter too early. So I guess I'll be the second to shamelessly plug our organization. Um, but uh, commoncause.org slash Texas is the way to get in touch with us uh, as our state team. Um, you can also, I, I guess we're shamelessly plugging our Twitters. So uh, at Erisman Katia is, is there. Um, we'll do a lot of long threads of the late night hearings on election bills, which uh, happens many times uh, and will probably continue to happen as we go through like 26 hour hearings every session now, apparently. Um, but yeah, really appreciate uh, y'all's except like having us on here and, and the time to, to talk with y'all. Same for us. You can feel free to follow us on social media. We are always updating on what's happening, what's moving. And if it's not the Texas ledge, we're already shifting over to the State Board of Education. If you're interested in that, I would do a lot of work around that. Um, elections are already coming up, so we're already pivoting towards that. We're going to be having um, a really big youth program called Te Camp Texas Rising. If there are any young people that want to get plugged in to our trainings, um, you can follow us on social media. Uh, for Texas Rising, it's TEX uh, Rising. And then for TFN, just put Texas Freedom Network. Follow us on Instagram and, and uh, Facebook and Twitter. I think we have it. 
Uh, if you want to follow me, um, all of mine are the same. It's R Fierro Perez. And yeah, it's been really great uh, talking with you all. If you have any questions or want to connect, uh, you can reach out to me personally too. My email is my name, rocio at tfn.org. So thank you all for what you do and for being here today. Well, thank you so much. And thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. And for those in the audience, before you go, we do have an update on some of the uh, issues that ADL advocated on. Uh, so we touched on some of them during our panel discussion, but want to turn it over to Courtney Toretto, our Associate Director of Policy, to give just a brief update and rundown. Um, I know many folks uh, at ADL uh, received many emails about things going on to the legislature. And you might be wondering what happened to those bills that I told the legislature to either support or oppose. Well, Courtney's gonna give us a brief update before we log off. So Courtney, I'll turn it over to you. Hey everyone. Um, so I've spoken to some of you. I am the Associate Director of Policy for the Central Division. Um, I actually began with the ADL smack dab in the middle of the Texas ledge. Um, I come from Congressman Doggett's office. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. So although um, there were nearly 12,000 pieces of legislation that actually were filed this session, ADL monitored about over 100 of the bills throughout the session, although there were more that were on our radar as legislation changed and things shifted. Um, so just a little recap of our engagement. Um, four cards were dropped in person um, at the Capitol on behalf of ADL. Um, they, those were for SB 12, which was the anti-drag bill, um, SB 17, um, which was the anti-DEI anti bill, SB 1515, which was the Ten Commandments in Schools bill, and we um, dropped a card in support of House Bill 1212, which was excused absences for religious holidays. Um, ADL regional directors attended events and supported the AAPI community in fighting back against legislation that would restrict property ownership based on national origin. That was SB 147, and luckily that didn't progress any further past the Senate. Um, action alert. So that's where y'all came in. So thank you so much for your participation. So ADL volunteer leaders and community partners sent letters to elected officials on 12 bills on issues ranging from anti-LGBTQ+, issues to religious freedom to protecting inclusive education for all. Um, as Jake mentioned, um, our most popular engagement from ADL supporters was asking the legislature not to support the Ten Commandments bill with 312 different people taking action. The actions of our volunteer leaders was felt at the Capitol because SB 1515 did not pass before the closure of session despite numerous attempts. Um, ADL worked with partner organizations such as Equality Texas and Asian Texans for Justice to amplify their messages, such as forwarding on emails or sharing their social media posts, all to show support of our allies. Um, the five bills passed of the ones we've been monitoring and were sent to the governor, and ADL advocated for or against uh, apologies, ADL <laughs> advocated for or against four of them we opposed. One we supported, um, we were against SB 12, which was the anti-drag bill, SB 14, which was the transgender youth health care, SB 17, which was anti-DEI in universities, and SB 763, which was the chaplains in school. We were opposed to all of those. Um, the one that we supported um, that did make it, that will be sent to the governor's desk is um, House Bill 1212, Religious Holidays Excused in School. Um, just for your continued awareness, ADL submitted two veto requests to Governor Abbott, um, one on SB 14 and one on SB 763. Um, while Governor Abbott has until June 18th to sign or veto legislation, I will say he has already signed SB 14. Um, as you all know, immediately after the end of regular session, Governor Abbott called for the first of probably multiple special sessions. Um, this special session, according to Governor Abbott, is supposed to be focused solely on property taxes and smuggling at the borders. However, as we suspect will happen in other special sessions, other pieces of legislation are being filed, including there was a Ten Commandments bill that was filed on Monday um, for this special session. Whether the House comes back into the House is adjourned, whether they come back and even look at any of these bills is anyone's guess, but we are still monitoring. Um, as mentioned, he is, Governor Abbott has stated his intent to hold at least one additional special session to try and enact policy on expanding school vouchers, as we discussed. We will monitor. We will keep you all posted. 
any moves that ADL makes. So the ADL policy team will stay engaged throughout the interim and simultaneously begin planning for 2025, which is when our next session will be. Um, and I would, I know we're running low on time, but I would be remiss with if we don't mention what's next. Um, our volunteer leaders for ADL are incredible and they are passionate and we appreciate all that you continue to do. And there's a lot of clamoring for what's, what's next. And I just want to remind, as you all know, that advocacy doesn't end when session ends. Um, we will continue building coalitions. We will create and sustain relationships with local elected officials and we will find ways to ensure your engagement and your participation. And it's also really important that we as an organization and as volunteer leaders are good allies when these harmful pieces of legislation go into effect. For instance, SB 14 doesn't come into effect until September 1st, um, but there are a lot of opportunities for us to show our support and uplift um, communities that are really being affected by some of this harmful legislation. Um, so stay tuned for future opportunities to participate um, um, and opportunities uh, to advocate with ADL on state and local issues. Well, thank you, Courtney, for, for that summary and rundown. Uh, you, you hit the time exactly. And I want to thank uh, you for putting that together. You would Folks in the audience would not know that this is only uh, less than two months that you've been with ADL, so, so great work. And huge thanks to Jake Kurtz on moderating our panel today. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from um, all our panelists and their perspective. And thank you to our wonderful team of Margie, Leah, and Dulce uh, for helping to put together the various webinars throughout the Texas Legislative Session. That concludes for tonight. Um, there will be more to come, um, and we look forward to working with our partners, elected officials, and of course our volunteer leaders. Thanks so much for joining us this evening, and that concludes tonight's webinar.